Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So we actually heard that the bookseller across the lake from us actually knew a thing or two about cloud computing. So, no, really, in serious, we all owe Amazon a, a great deal of, of debt and gratitude for actually pioneering cloud computing for the last two or three years. And we have much to learn from them. And I'm pleased to introduce Deepak Singh, who'll be telling us about Amazon and what they're doing in research and science applications. Thank you. Uh, can, you can everybody hear me? Uh, sounds like it. So actually, Ed just gave my talk, so you can all leave and get another one and a half hours of, uh, uh, of, of a break now. Um, so yeah, uh, thank, you for, thank you, Roger, for asking me to speak. Usually, I speak really quick, really fast, but uh, we have a little more time than I'm used to. So I think we're going to relax a little bit, go slower. Uh, during the course of the presentation, if there's any questions or clarifications, please do ask. Uh, I like it being interactive. so. Uh, just, just holler. Uh, some quick history. So I've been at Amazon now for about, well, it'll be two years in June, uh, and all at Amazon Web Services. By day, I manage uh, EC2, so that's from the business development side. That's, my, that's, that's what I do. But I spent my entire life before that in the life science industry. Mostly, uh, my background historically is in large-scale molecular simulations, and I started off as a quantum chemist. But uh, before I came to Amazon, I spent some time at another company out here in Seattle called Rosetta Biosoftware, which is now part of Microsoft, uh, working as a strategist. Um, so I got involved in gene large-scale data management, gene expression, and uh, genetics and genotyping. Uh, so this is a fee uh, so because of that, my talk tends to be very life science biased. So I apologize to every other field of science for that, but uh, that's the nature of the game. Uh, so let's get started. And the reason, and Ed laid it out quite nicely, is we are here to talk about data, not my favorite Android, but the kind of data one gets from large projects, and historically has from large space projects. We talked about how astronomy has been instrumental, not just in creating a lot of data, but in developing sciences that will not necessarily do a good job in managing it, but they have to analyze a lot of it. The high energy physics community, on the other hand, has had to do a lot of work in trying to figure out how to manage very, very large scale data, uh, data projects across not just uh, labs, but across continents, because the LHC is not just a European project. There's people from all over the world trying to, uh, trying to work on it, even when bagels bring it down. Uh, but near and dear to my heart is instruments like these. This is an older Illumina genome analyzer uh, with the root password and login information on there. So if you want to hack into the Sanger Center and start doing some sequencing, you can probably do that. Uh, but the difference that these things make compared to the space and uh, LHC type projects that we just talked about is the sheer throughput and at which they generate data. Space projects, high energy physics projects take 10 years. People collect data over a long period of time, analyze data over a long period of time. This instrument is a few years old and it's obsolete. Uh, the amount, the data volume is being pushed by these, and the changes in the kind of data and the, just the technology is pretty intense. Uh, and this is happening in the life sciences and other fields as well, uh, pretty much as we speak. Uh, another area that's interesting is, and we've heard quite a bit about this, is things sensor-based projects, things like the Ocean Observatories Initiative, where you have sensors, ambient systems all over the world collecting data, which people are either analyzing after the fact or in real time, depending on your needs. Uh, I forget, I was talking to somebody outside from Newcastle where they were talking about ambient sort of neurological projects where they're trying to analyze data from people's homes and trying to predict whether they're having some kind of uh, uh, neurological symptoms. And of course, computers themselves generate a lot of data. You, you could be a web company, uh, just click stream data, as probably people who've worked on the live side of Microsoft know, uh, generates terabytes and terabytes of data. There's people collecting data and trying to analyze it. Uh, people taking data from these instruments and creating second rounds of data, which can often exceed the initial data. So it's a very interesting time. It's a time where a single genome makes no sense. There's no such thing as the human genome anymore. Instead, what we have is everyone's genome. Uh, we have genomes of cancers. We have genome of every individual. We could have genomes of everybody in this building, everybody on this campus. That's quite a lot of people. So what does that mean? Let's leave the, uh, let's leave the space and uh, LHC types aside for a second. 
Scientists who've typically been used to working in the gigabytes, the kinds of people who used to work with Excel and do joins across spreadsheets, they're kind of getting into this whole terabyte scale thing and they're just starting to get used to it, but it might be too late. By the time they get used to terabytes, terabytes might, the petabyte might be the old terabyte. And that's kind of the uh, joke we have at Amazon where the petabyte is the new terabyte. Uh, you know, that's what we see. And if you believe some people, we're actually going to be at the excess scale pretty soon. Uh, I think it's going to take, for most scientific projects, except the really, really large ones, going to take a little bit of time to get to the excess scale, but I've been wrong before. And the big difference, as I just sort of alluded to, is we're collecting this data really fast. It's not being collected over five years. It's been collected over weeks, and you have to analyze it over weeks, which means, and the cost has gone down enough that it's no longer, this is the picture of the Broad Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is a big genome center. There were 100 Illumina sequencers. But the, as, as Ed again said, you have folks like Ginger Ambrose who can get a sequencer and collect a lot of data and, and generate a lot of data and have to figure out how to manage it. So I completely agree. I did not put this in after Ed started speaking. I had this in earlier. Uh, it's actually a great book. If anybody hasn't read it, it's available somewhere on the website. Uh, uh, about how data, how scientific discovery, I come from a simulation background where data sizes were in the kilobytes, uh, and trying to generate molecular trajectories and uh, uh, rotation functions and rotomer uh, energy surfaces. But more and more, science is going into a state where you're collecting data and you have to analyze it to try and figure out what's happening, which means that you're going through a lot of change. Uh, and it's a very rapid change, and it's a change in scale. It's a scale that a lot of scientists, especially the kinds that I've historically worked with, aren't used to dealing with, which means they have to completely rethink the way they handle their daily chores. They have to start thinking about things like data management. Um, I like saying that data management is not data storage. I've, I don't know how often I've heard from people, oh, I can go to Fry's and buy a terabyte, size, you know, multi-terabytes of hard disk. Um, yeah, but that doesn't quite work. I mean, you have to try and make this data available to other people, share it with other people, go back to it and try and analyze it. They have to rethink how they process that data. A lot of the, the slightly coupled codes that uh, are written in Fortran, I've written a few of those myself, and they are a piece of junk, uh, don't quite work. And you have to start thinking about new ways to scale out your data. You have to realize that at scale, a lot of the assumptions you make about infrastructure change. And one of the last projects I was involved with when I was at Rosetta was a project with the FDA where we didn't have that much data, just short of a terabyte. There are about 10 institutions, companies, uh, academic groups, the FDA involved. And what we had to do was we were collecting this data and everybody was, had a different slice of the pie that they were trying to solve. But the project took a while starting because we had to ship the data from each group to each group on a disk. And it took about, what, 10 weeks to get it, FedEx, uh, get it FedEx to everybody and make sure everyone had it. That's not how you can share data anymore. In the past, if you went to a data repository like NCBI, you could just FTP it down, you could bring your data to your desktop, to your workstation, analyze it. But when the 1000 Genomes project is multi terabytes and you want it in, on your desktop, one, you have to find a hard drive big enough, which is not easily doable. You have to go to a shared system or something like that. Or you have to start thinking about things like the cloud, where you get a common area where you can start sharing that data. And it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a constant problem, and the data volumes are changing rapidly enough that a lot of scientists haven't had time to figure out how to build these systems, how to think about it. Uh, and what they end up doing is get in situations like this one. Uh, I don't know which lab this is. I won't call out names. This is about 188 terabytes of sequence data on somebody's lab bench. You can't really process it because it's not connected to anything. You can't really share it because you need all that data and trying to move it around and shipping it to your collaborator is not going to be trivial. And what happens if one of those it's on a lab bench, there's water around, there's solvents around. What happens if something falls on it? You, you're, you're in deep trouble. Uh, this is a picture I borrowed from Chris Dugdigian of the Bio team. And uh, he talks about the, about the fact that in 20, uh, 2009 was the first time that A, he mounted a single petabyte volume onto a compute cluster. It was also the first time that he saw somebody being fired for a petabyte scale data, data loss. So science is, science is getting compute and storage limited today. Uh, I know a lot of projects which don't start because they don't have the storage or they don't have the compute or they don't have easily accessible storage or compute and they have to scrounge around, try and find, try and find resources, go to their friends at a supercomputer center, which most of us have done at some point in time and ask for time. But as, more and, as you need more and more resources, getting your friend to be nice to you becomes a little more difficult. So I started thinking about some of these problems a few years ago and that's kind of how I ended up at Amazon. So for the next, uh, uh, we'll see. A uh, few minutes. I'd like to spend some time talking about Amazon Web Services. Uh, 
we hear various definitions of the cloud. Dip different people have different opinions of the cloud. Uh, for the purposes of this conversation and for what AWS does, we are infrastructure as a service. Essentially, what we provide is a toolkit, a toolkit that allows people to do stuff uh, for what it's worth. Um, it uses some basic building blocks. So how many people here have used any of AWS's services? Fair number. Bill, you're not allowed to raise your hand. I know you have. Uh, so EC2 is where I spend most of my time. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, EC2 is essentially getting a virtualized server in an Amazon data center, or getting 10, or getting 100, or getting 200. It's essentially, with, with simple web services APIs, you can provision lots of uh, server uh, computer resources. You can run Linux, you can run Windows, you can put your own apps on it. You, can, you essentially control. Uh, once, you get the, once you get the server, that's what you control. And people can do all kinds of things with it. Historically, our, most of our customers came because of Amazon's uh, history from the web community, people doing a lot of uh, e-commerce, people building new software service stacks, and of course it's evolved from there to people running SharePoint <laughs> on, on AWS. Uh, on top of that, over time, we've added things like load balancers and the ability to scale based on some metrics, based on some triggers. Uh, the other key sort of component uh, to this, what I call core infrastructure, is storage. Uh, and the service that we actually launched AWS with was Amazon's uh, S3. It's the service that a lot of people tend to get involved with first. If anybody uses Twitter, that's where your thumbnail is, you know, just as an example. Uh, S3 is a massively distributed object store. It's not a file system. Every piece of data you push on it gets replicated across multiple uh, data centers. The idea and design point is that it should be highly available and highly durable, and that you should be able to scale up as your needs be. And I'll get back to that in a bit later. Um, Things that we've added to it, I'll speak to it again later, is the ability to import and export your data from S3 using a physical disk, uh, using FedEx, because some, the network's not always the easiest way of getting data in and out, uh, not for everyone. And, and, I did, and at AWS, we also consider databases a core piece of infrastructure, because the belief we have is that you shouldn't need to manage your own database, whether it be a relational database. So we have a service called RDS, which is essentially managed MySQL. Uh, what you do, what a, as a user, you just provision a MySQL instance. It's MySQL as you know it, but you don't have to be the DBA. We've got people running around at the back doing that for you. Uh, you can scale up and down. You can scale up your server with an API call. Uh, you can uh, add new resources. You can grow your disk. Again, it's all APIs or going through a, or going through a simple interface that does it. You don't have to worry about that. We try and work on the optimization and the tuning. It's still a relatively young service that's going to evolve. Uh, one of the things that we announced when we launched RDS was the, the fact that MySQL is, most people don't know how to run MySQL in a high availability system. So one of the things we're working on is the ability for you to, uh, to fail over into a different data center without actually having to go through the uh, pains of doing it yourself. We'll do it automatically for you. And simple DB is a simple, uh, it's a key value column store uh, is one way of looking at it. It's, it's a, if I can use a buzzword, a NoSQL schemaless a database, which a lot of people use for storing metadata. Uh, Netflix, for example, uses it to store their uh, Netflix queues. Uh, on top of that, we have, we've added over time a bunch of other things. Uh, one of my favorites is a parallel processing framework which encapsulates Hadoop called Amazon Elastic MapReduce. Uh, for people, you know, a, half, a big chunk of our users run Hadoop for doing things like log analysis, if nothing else. And it, they were struggling at that time, especially when Hadoop was in like dot one five, dot one six, just with keeping things up, keeping things stable. Uh, Hadoop's not exactly the most uh, stable thing in a shared environment. So we decided to build a system that helps them uh, stay away from managing the Hadoop side and just give them an API to that. Uh, when S3 launched, a lot of people were obviously storing content in it and distributing content. Um, I, for years, have had a video sharing site and a podcast where all the content goes into S3 and people download it, but Obviously, there's folks in other countries and far away who, and people are essentially using S3 as a content delivery network. So we launched CloudFront, which is a CDN that sits on top of S3, and uh, we have a bunch of edge servers that deliver the content to edge locations. Messaging is a core part of a distributed, uh, distributed infrastructure. Uh, for if you're building sort of asynchronous applications in a, in, and you want uh, good fault tolerance and good, and, and good sort of uh, uh, things that are, that are loosely coupled, uh, using messaging is usually a good way of doing it. Uh, we started off, and actually SQS is, an, is our oldest service. I think it was launched after S3, though. 
uh, which allows you to just run a simple pull-based pull uh, messaging infrastructure in the cloud. And just uh, two days ago, we announced a service called the Simple Notification Service, which is a real-time pub-sub service. It's a sister service to, S uh, to uh, SQS, where essentially you publish a topic, people can subscribe to it, and it gets delivered to them over HTTP or over SMTP in real time. Uh, I think at some point of time, we'll add SMS to it as well. And of course, we've got we have Amazon, we have a good payments platform, and uh, for those of you who like getting things looked at by humans, we have a service called Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, it's, it's actually quite unique. If anybody has questions, catch me afterwards. I won't spend much time on it here. And at the end, the, we've added a bunch of other sort of infrastructure management services. Amazon CloudWatch is a monitoring service that takes care of your infrastructure, gives you a whole bunch of metrics. Based on those metrics, you can auto-scale automatically. Or you know, the two things that auto-scaling does is let's say you're servicing a lot of load, you can add new servers just to handle the load and take them away. When the load goes down, the other thing that you can do is let's say you want an infrastructure of 20 servers across two data centers, and you want to keep them at 20 servers across two data centers. You can use the auto-scaling functionality and these metrics to make sure that's happening. Uh, so you can, you can build nice fault-tolerant architectures. We have a management console. We have toolkits for Eclipse and .NET. And I'll get back to this later, the ability to uh, deploy by, uh, virtually isolated networks, what we call the virtual private cloud. And with all of that, what you can do is build your applications and services. But what's really cool about all of this is the fact that you can do it either using a simple UI, or the way I like doing it, sitting at a command line and orchestrating an entire infrastructure. Uh, you can evaluate your servers. You can launch new servers. You can launch new services. You can launch elastic MapReduce jobs, all from the command line tools. Or if you, somebody likes the UI, you can do it that way. Or if you like mobile devices, you can use your iPhone to manage your infrastructure. So one of the things that everybody recognizes and uh, associates Amazon Web Services with is elasticity. Uh, as an example, here is one of uh, my favorite use cases. This is a hedge fund based out on Wall Street. This is a typical user, user scenario for them. They run about 3,000 servers at night before the market's open running a bunch of risk analysis models during the day they keep at you know they sort of keep at a lower uh, lower baseline on weekends they're back at that lower baseline but again for about six hours to eight hours every night they spin up it works very nicely this is the kind of uh, usage graph that you'll see across many 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 customers especially people in the data analytics business intelligence space who have customers or uh, financial modeling to do the other thing that folks associate with aws is scalability uh, an example of that on the storage side is MugMug. It's a photo sharing site for, I call it the prosumer crowd because they don't have a free uh, level. Everything is paid for. And they support raw uh, uh, formats from SLR cameras and so on and so forth. Uh, SmugMug has been on AWS for a long time. This is an old number from like a year and a half ago when they had over a petabyte of data uh, in S3. And they've grown since then. Uh, Ed's already shown you this one. Uh, with this, which is the classic Animoto story where they had to go from a uh, baseline of about 50 servers to 3,000 servers because they launched a Facebook app. And that happens uh, a lot. I mean, there's companies, I know Ed says don't play Farmville, but please play Farmville. That way my revenue number targets get easier to hit because it runs on AWS. Uh, they would not have been able to scale the, as fast as they did uh, in a, in a non-cloud infrastructure. But the thing that people tend not to forget, and I think this is what I like reminding a lot of scientists on, that cloud infrastructures, the people building these cloud infrastructures come from a world where highly available infrastructures is necessary. And most scientific infrastructures, like this one, are not highly available. Uh, as Werner Vogels likes to say, everything fails all the time. Uh, Jeff Dean from Google once said, uh, I gave a really nice talk at Cornell last year, and I'll steal a lot of his data from there. Uh, he says, things crash, deal with it. Um, I think he had a num uh, number in there which he said, you build an X number of node cluster, watch it for a day, and see servers fall. Uh, it happens. And when you are at scale, you have to deal with things like that. If you're running a workstation underneath your desk, like many of us did in graduate school, or, or a few nodes somewhere, you don't have to deal with it that much. 2 to 4% of servers will die annually. It doesn't sound re much, but when you're crunching on a lot of data over a lot, lot of servers, that becomes uh, viable. So you have to prepare for failure. You can't just restart your calculation in about four days in when one node suddenly goes away, and you have to start from scratch. I've had customers do that because they were using a very traditional clustering environment. But if 1 to 5% of disk drives will die, die every year. One of the things that S3 does, uh, I'll get back to it, actually. Uh, but perhaps the most common error, especially in environments where your infrastructure is managed by graduate students who really aren't really good at managing infrastructures, is the biggest 
issue is going to be systems administration errors. Somebody doing a bad config, somebody setting up a SMTP relay with a problem, somebody misconfiguring a, a cluster. And when availability of infrastructure and reliability of infrastructure becomes important, you really have to start thinking about who's keeping it up, how they're keeping it up, how, they, how you're doing it. So if you want your infrastructure to be scalable and available, you have to assume hardware and software failure. So you have to design your apps to be resilient. These are not just the apps that are running on the infrastructure, but also the apps and software layer managing that infrastructure. You have to start thinking about things like automation and alarming. Now again, in a research environment, in a scientific environment, that's not usually what most people think about, especially in a day where a small lab is being able to generate a lot of information. At the University of Washington last summer, so my wife works at the Genome Sciences, uh, uh, in the Genome Sciences building, Every Sunday for a while, because there was a heat wave, their cooling system used to go down and you couldn't access the cluster. So for a day or two, you couldn't do any work. Uh, maybe it's okay, well, which I, I don't think it is. So that's the kind of thing that Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, Google, that's kind of the environment we come from. For example, with EC2, everyone who launches servers in our east region gets four different availability zones. And an availability zone, for all practical purposes, is a failure mode independent data center. You can pick and choose which one you want to run in. You could choose to run across. You could choose to run in one. You have the option of running across AZs and, and building failure tolerance into your applications. S3 goes one step better. It automatically replicates data across physical data centers. It's constantly checksumming. It's constantly checking for bit rot. The goal is you shouldn't lose your data. You should have a highly reliable and durable infrastructure. So as an academic or as a researcher, whether you're in, commerce, in a commercial entity or in an academic entity, you, don't, you shouldn't really need to think about, OK, how am I going to build a really reliable infrastructure? If a data center is a single point of failure, I need two. Um, where do I find the second one? How do I get distributed architectures? It's not something I've done before. Well, somebody has done it for you. Uh, start, you, know, you can think about using it. Uh, the other thing that happens is there's a whole bunch of other services that we've had to build over the years, either internally or for the people using us, that, try and, that help people become uh, scalable and fault tolerant. Things like elastic load balancing, which balances load across data centers. I've already talked about auto-scaling. Elastic IPs are the ability to take an IP address and move it from server to server, pretty much. The elasticity lies in the fact that you can take an IP and move it from one server to another server. Uh, Elastic Block Store is, again, one of my favorite services. You can essentially provision block devices with an API call. Uh, you can resize them. You can move them from one disk to another disk. Uh, SQS and SNS I've talked about, and CloudWatch is our monitoring service. And the other part is that they need to be cost effective. And one of the, if James Hamilton was here giving this talk, he'd spend half an hour talking about economies of scale for large scale, uh, large scale computing. So, but I won't talk necessarily about that. But the other core part of AWS is pay as you go is that you should be paying for what you're using. As an example, I'll talk about EC2. So EC2 has three different ways of paying for it. The one that most people are familiar with is the one on top over there called on-demand instances. You run a, a Linux server for an hour, you pay eight and a half cents. You run it, you run, uh, it used to be easier to do this, this math in my head when it was 10 cents an hour. Uh, so essentially what it means, if you're running 10 servers for an hour or one server for 10 hours, it's going to cost you the, roughly the same amount of money because you're paying for the time that servers are on. Now that pricing assumes a certain utilization. There are some people who are running applications all the time. They want those servers to be available all the time. And they don't mind absorbing some of that risk. So what they do is they pay up front. This is the pricing model we introduced about a year ago. But for, for the upfront that they pay $200 or so for a small, small instance, they now pay an operational, uh, operational cost of instead of eight and a half cents an hour, they pay three cents an hour. So that's a model that works really well for people running databases, highly utilized infrastructures, which is not that many people. And last December-ish, we came up with my favorite, uh, favorite uh, pricing model, which is spot instances. At any point in time, we carry some overhead. There's, uh, you, there's uh, in pieces of the infrastructure not being used. So what we created was a market. Uh, essentially, as a user, you can bid uh, a price on it, for example, for an eight and a half cent instance, for doing some job that you may never do otherwise because you don't have the compute time or something that you don't believe is worth paying eight and a half cents for. Uh, example I use is in chemistry, there's 2D to 3D transformations that you have to do for your chemical library. It's just grunt work. You have to do it, but uh, you want it to happen and not worry about it. Spot instances are great for things like that. It's actually great for the kind of things that David Baker has developed with uh, uh, Rosetta at home because Screensaver projects assume that screensavers get shut off. 
Uh, so they're meant to be run piecemeal. So what you can do is say, I won't pay more than three cents an hour for this server. And underneath that, we have a dynamic market that changes based on supply and demand. So if your price falls below three cents an hour, your instances start. So let's say the price is at two cents an hour, you essentially pay two cents an hour. The price goes up to 2.2, you pay 2.2. The caveat is if it crosses three, what you had bid, your servers get shut down. Uh, so if you are used to writing checkpoint, checkpointing files, if you're used to uh, assuming that things go away, this is a great infrastructure. So what do people use it for? For this pricing model, scientific computing is actually a great use case. Last week, I was talking to somebody uh, at a financial services company who's running MATLAB workers on, but exclusively using spot instances. Because each job that he has is a few minutes. And uh, if he loses one or two, he can always restart. Web crawling is another one that's very common. You're indexing stuff, you don't mind. And of course, a lot of these screensaver type projects work really well. So the other core tenet of the infrastructure is security. Uh, you know, you've got cameras built on you. Uh, when you're building a large-scale uh, infrastructure, especially coming from a retail background, you have to be very particular about security. I won't go into the details of a security model if people want to talk. Uh, happy to do that after the fact. But some of the co one of the things that we do, especially at the instance level, is what we've done is move a lot of the sec uh, software that would normally sit in your router onto our, actually just below our virtualization stack. So essentially it acts as a traffic, traffic cop and inspects every packet coming into every instance and it decides who gets access to it, what should be done with it, and so on and so forth. But people still like more control. So for those people, we developed something called the virtual private cloud, which uh, our folks in uh, Virginia who developed it called a data center on a stick. Uh, let's say you have a hardware device in your data center. You have a corresponding gateway inside uh, an Amazon data center. And what you essentially get is a virtually isolated network uh, which right now is so virtually isolated you can't access anything else with it. If you want to access even a file uh, on the web, you have to go through the gateway. So what this means is you can bring your own address range into AWS. You can uh, use your standard network security policies. The network engineers and uh, the guys managing network security love it because they don't need to change anything. Uh, you can create your own subnets, build your own DMZs, and so on. Over time, we'll open up the kimono into other AWS services and allow you internet access. But we started off by going the usual default route, uh, which is basically shut everybody out and assume everybody is malicious, uh, which, which works. So that was the sort of what is AWS spiel. Now let's get to the fun part and talk about why I believe science and Amazon Web Services is a good thing. And in sort of large scale distributed cloud infrastructures in general. We talked about uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey in the last talk. Uh, there's a project called Galaxy Zoo. How many people have heard about it? Cool. There's actually, this is one of the few talks where the more than one hand went up uh, when I talked about it. So Galaxy Zoo won, uh, ran out of a server in Johns Hopkins. Uh, to, for those who don't know, Galaxy Zoo is a citizen science project where they take data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and they allow people uh, who are not necessarily astronomers to classify galaxies based on certain criteria. They never expected it to be this popular. Now this could be an urban legend, but apparently the first time uh, the gal first Galaxy Zoo, they got more traffic than they expected and the server at JHU caught fire, uh, which was a problem. So when Galaxy Zoo 2 started, they decided to go for a much more scalable infrastructure and built it on AWS with a nice, uh, nice uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, loosely coupled infrastructure. Uh, they actually used a tool called Vehicle Assembly, uh, which, you can open, which you can get from uh, GitHub, which was written to deploy uh, genome sequencing algos so the guy who built this used to work at a genome center, had moved to Oxford. And this is now run out of Oxford in the UK. This is just some of the early stats that they saw. They saw in the first three days that after Galaxy Zoo 2 was announced, they saw close to about four, class, four million classifications, uh, 15 million in, uh, in the first month or so. And at one point of time, um, they were tracking sort of how many clicks they got over a 100 hour period. And they had over two and a half million clicks. So that's if the first server caught fire, if they were still running on it, I don't know what would have happened. But this is a fun project, and it becomes possible. And you, I've seen other examples of people sort of running large-scale web infrastructures with, which have performance expectations. Uh, one of the things in the protein structure prediction community you often see is you find prediction servers, but when you go to them and you submit a simple sequence, you have to basically wait for hours while they're in queue. But if you want people to be able to access things like classifying galaxies, make it available to just not the experts, things like Foldit, you need to, have, you need to start thinking about good web infrastructures. And I think this is one way of getting there. But the reason we are here is we have lots and lots and lots and lots of data. And lots and lots of data uh, has challenges with scalability and availability, as I hope uh, both Ed and I con convinced you. But then you have 
scientists who, they're data geeks. Uh, Warren Bell has written a book called Mind Hacks, if anybody's not read it, it's a great book. And Duncan Hull, who doesn't quite look like that anymore, uh, works at the EBI, I think, right these days. Uh, they're, data, they're, they're, they're basically informaticians that, you know, they, they like mining and analyzing data. What they don't necessarily like doing is worrying about the infrastructure that's running on. So, data management is a huge challenge. Data management, as I told you uh, in his last talk, people often worry about data by putting it in flat files. I remember my first startup, we took data from the PDB. Every piece of data that came, uh, we looked at the four letter code of the PDB file, took the middle two letters, made it a folder, and everything came in underneath that. So we had hundreds of folders in a hierarchy that went below that. Uh, in those days, it was okay, because the PDB was small. If you did it today, uh, you'd have a pretty rough tree that you have to traverse for every single job. And as scientists, what you want to do is find out everything, is to answer questions. Your question might be, tell me everything I know about Shaquille O'Neal, from the gene expression data, from the pro proteomics data, from the, you know, from the GVAS data, uh, from a pathway database, and collect all this data and be able to analyze it. And for that, you need good data management systems. You need systems that allow people that you collaborate with or other scientists to be able to go in after the fact, maybe even after the primary analysis, and try and figure out, OK, here's the new data I have. Here's all the correlation, correlated information. What's the biology of, what's Shaquille O'Neal's biology? Why is he seven foot two inches tall? And why doesn't he rebound well? Maybe not that question. Um, and it's not just about flat, flat files, it's not just about databases either. One of the things that AWS gives you is choice. Um, you can use a, a, a managed database like SimpleDB or RDS. You could re, use a massively distributed object store like S3. Or you could build stuff on your own uh, using EC2 and EBS. For example, there's a company called Recombinant. This is something that they built for a big pharma company, has built a biomarker warehouse using Oracle. Uh, it's about 10 terabyte warehouse over three years is what they cost it as. They could have built it themselves. This is, uh, again, as I said, a top 10, bio a top 10 pharma company. But they actually found it to be more cost effective, given the utilization rates, to build it on AWS. And it's a proper biomarker warehouse where they can go and do all the stuff that uh, you could do uh, in actually with a system like Rosetta Resolver, which came out of Rosetta, where, where I worked before. Uh, it also changes the way you approach data processing. Sure, today on AWS, you can run things like uh, UniCloud. UniCloud is by a company called Univa UD. They run on top of SunGrid Engine, but they provide basically policy management and user resource management. SunGrid Engine now natively supports EC2, so you, if you don't want the sort of business uh, process management that Univa provides, you can go straight to Oracle, I guess now, and get SunGrid Engine. I don't think they've killed it yet. Uh, or uh, we talked about Condor. Uh, cycle computing is sort of in, uh, in the middle. They take a technology like Condor, but they sort of abstract it away from the user and try to provide RESTful APIs. So as an end user, you talk to the API rather than to the Condor pools themselves. And they manage the back end and the load balancing and the scaling. Uh, so you know, they have an application called Cycle Blast, for example, uh, which allows you to do that. But the real fun comes when people start building their own cool tools. Uh, so Star Cluster comes out of MIT. It's essentially a cluster management system used for all kinds of fun projects. Uh, uh, it's come, again, you, you, the website is over there if you want to have a take a look at it. Anyone can download this army and run a star cluster installation. The folks at the New York Times actually set up, uh, a bunch of them got together and set up a nonprofit called uh, Document Cloud. And part of Document Cloud's goal is to, create, uh, is to make infrastructure available as open source that they're sort of built for things like the New York Times and things they do within, within that. This is a, something called Cloud Crowd. Cloud Crowd essentially runs, uses uh, SQS queues as your, uh, is your job state. And rather than a very heavy, even SunGrid Engine is fairly heavy in how it, how it manages resources. A very loosely coupled way of having one server spin, off, spin up workers when they need to, chunk up jobs as required based on a certain set of metrics. The source data is always in S3. Again, you can just, if you're a Ruby user, that's how you install Cloud Crowd. It's just a Ruby gem. Uh, RightScale has a very nice infrastructure, again, very nicely, loosely coupled dynamic clustering infrastructure called uh, RightGrid. Again, it uses SQS, our queuing system, as the job state. You can essentially set up error queues, audit queues, uh, output queues, have a bunch of messages sitting in the input queues which make decisions. Uh, part of the decision is that elasticity function up in that corner over there. Your elasticity, elasticity function can be the number of jobs. So it'll, based on the number of jobs, it'll scale up and down, and how many jobs per server. The other elasticity function they have is the money you want to spend. 
uh, per, and it basically builds, scales up your cluster based on how much your budget is. It's pretty cool, and it's pretty neat, and it's very dynamic. If you want to move clusters, uh, nodes in and out, you can do that. It's non-trivial with a traditional cluster setup. And again, you can do it either through their nice UI or through their Ruby gem. So there, there's multiple ways of doing this. And using this kind of stuff, people have started doing pretty interesting stuff, pretty interesting things. Ed's already talked about uh, John Rare's work on FEF. Uh, you know, part of the interest in FEF was, can we take old Fortran code designed to run on tightly coupled clusters? I believe when, when I last talked to John, he said was, or maybe the guy who funded him at the NSF, was there was a particular loop in it, which all, if all you had to do was make that loop embarrassingly parallel and he solved half the problems. Um, and I, I think they've continued to work on that. Uh, the folks on the bio team used the right grid architecture. This is again for a pharma company running David Baker's Rosetta program, uh, a Rosetta application, which actually put my first company out of business. Uh, and it basically sits in the queue, you basically are looking at how much data do I have, how many jobs do I want to run, and based on that, some bunch of JSON messages, you are spinning up the number of workers that you need, you're pulling data from S3, uh, and, they do, and part of the reason they built it was they got tired of waiting for IT to provide them the infrastructure that they needed. Uh, this is a group in a pharma company that's not at headquarters in the other side of the country. They don't get necessarily always get the love that they think they need. And this is an infrastructure that worked really well. Scientists can run it. Somebody built it for them. They don't need IT support. Uh, it works quite well. Uh, IT found out eventually, and they started managing it. Uh, my friend Matt Wood, at the, who was then at the Sanger, one day decided, hey, let me try assembling a genome on AWS. This is a couple of years ago, before I was at Amazon, I think. Uh, he took about 100 and, 140 million reads from uh, a 454 sequencer, wrote two open source applications that were uh, called uh, Mission Control and Launchpad. Uh, Launchpad and Vehicle Assembly, which I already talked about, deployed his application on AWS. And Mission Control is this uh, uh, Ruby on Rails application which he uses to monitor his, work, monitor his jobs. And very quickly was up and running in, a, in you know, basically the time it took him to write up the code and deploy this. It makes it very easy for people who are interested in writing algorithms, writing de uh, de deployment systems, writing infrastructure, as developers to experiment, to, make, to do that stuff, and then make that stuff available to everybody else because you know, it's, it's just a Linux server. If you have an Amazon machine image, you can do pretty interesting things. Uh, I talked about cloud, uh, cl uh, uh, cloud Crowd. That was written originally at the New York Times to take images and transform them into another kind, you know, transforming image formats. This is a group at uh, the Penn or Penn State? I think Penn which basically took BLAT, which is a genome assembly sort of uh, algo, which it tends to be somewhat memory heavy. Uh, they use Cloud Crowd, which, and this is how you actually run it. Again, Cloud Crowd is a Ruby app. Uh, wrote up a quick script, pointed it to the input files, and voila, 32 hours and uh, 200 bucks later, they were done. And they've continued to do that. That group actually uses uh, a lot, does a lot of proteomics on AWS as well. It's basically, you have all these tools floating around built by people to do one thing and somebody else finds them and does fun stuff with it. Um, the other interesting area uh, is uh, heavy ion collisions. Uh, heavy ion collisions are, so this is from, I think, uh, this is a project I've called the STAR project, I think, which uses the, uh, an ion collider at Brookhaven, if I remember correctly. They had a conference to get to very quickly. They had to get data for a conference and their internal resources were kind of not available. And very often I find is that the first time an academic or a researcher will use AWS is when they have a conference to go to, a paper to submit, or the boss has asked them for data over the weekend. Uh, they use something called Nimbus, which is a context broker developed at Argonne National Labs. They have their own uh, uh, sort of a cloud-like environment at Argonne, but one of the things that they designed it for was using Nimbus, you can easily go on to EC2, because their environment is still limited. If they want people to get more resources, you can just overflow onto EC2. So they used the Nimbus uh, environment, uh, provisioned a bunch of nodes, and got the simulations done. I'm not much of a particle physicist, so I'm not 100% sure what exactly they found from it. Ted Liefeld, whose name's missing, at the University of Melbourne has built an infrastructure which he plans to share with his collaborators to do Monte Carlo simulations from the Bell experiment, which is part of the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, it's just a very nicely, nicely Again, sort of loosely coupled based on messaging infrastructure to start doing, uh, running a bunch of workers to analyze data as they get it from this experiment. Uh, the experiment, I don't think, is quite kicked into full gear. 
Uh, but at some point, hopefully, it will. And there's a bunch of people collaborating on it. Ted happens to be at Melbourne. And they do that quite a bit. But everything I've talked about till now has still been sort of mostly chunking up jobs across worker nodes, which is something that we've done for years. Yes, having dynamic, sort of having computing com as a commodity, having fungible servers, as I like to say, makes it a lot easier and makes it a lot more flexible. But what happens when you have tons of data? You can't really chunk it up that easily. You can't move it around servers that easily. Uh, your disk reads and writes are slow and expensive. Data processing, on the other hand, is fast and cheap. So one solution to that is distribute the data and parallelize your reads. And that's what's something that Hadoop does really well. Uh, for those of you uh, who may not know what Hadoop is, um, it's, not data it's not a cloud environment. You can run Hadoop anywhere. But it sort of fits the cloud paradigm really well, because it's designed to be fault tolerant. It's designed to run on commodity machines. It assumes that hardware is going to fail and takes that into account. So what does it have? It has two components. One is a distributed file system for HDFS. Uh, and the other part is a MapReduce implementation. So Hadoop was developed by Doug Cutting uh, as an extension to the Lucene project. Doug went uh, after, he, after he read the MapReduce paper from Google. After that, he was hired by Yahoo, where he did a lot of his MapReduce work. And now he works at a company called Cloudera. Uh, Ed showed you a picture of Christoph Bisiglia. Christoph was one of the founders of Cloudera. And they're sort of the red hat of the Hadoop world, uh, so to speak. So how does MapReduce work? Well, it's pretty simple in some ways. Uh, as a developer, you write a map function, which takes a bunch of keys and values and creates a bunch of keys and values, or a list of keys and values. And at the reduce phase, you essentially aggregate them. Uh, it's more complicated than it looks over here, but uh, it works very well, especially for large data sets, for things like aggregation, for things like analyzing log files, and a, a bunch of other use cases uh, that people, especially in the web companies who sort of developed and pioneered this, didn't really think about. But you still have to write functional programs. And not everybody in science, especially, or outside science, really knows much about functional programming. So there's some very nice frameworks that have been built on top of Hadoop. One of the nice things about being a B Apache project is people can do a lot of interesting things on top of you. Uh, so cascading is a framework that I really like. Uh, it's essentially a data flow system, uh, very similar, I think, to Dryad in some ways, uh, where as a user, you define a data flow. And cascading takes up the whole job of writing out the MapReduce functions underneath it. You are just writing a data flow. Now, cascading also works with any language in the JVM. So you can write cascading in Java. You can write it in JRuby. You can write it in Clojure. Uh, pick your JVM language, Scala, Hask, you know, things like that. Um, the folks at Yahoo developed something called Pig, which is, again, a more uh, it's, again, it's, a script, it's almost like a scripting language. I like to think about it as Perl for Hadoop, because you're basically writing a scripting language, and that takes care of your uh, Hadoop jobs. And the fo folks at Facebook developed something called Hive. For a lot of their product managers and analysts, they're used to writing SQL queries. So they wrote a SQL-like language that sits, again, on, sit of, sits on top of Hadoop. With, and Facebook has terabytes and terabytes of data. And uh, they need to be able to do ad hoc analyses, and Hive's been uh, really key to helping them get there. So there's all these higher level languages and higher level systems that have come on top of Hadoop, which has made it a very dynamic and growing system. And one of the biggest use cases on top of AWS, especially in the web world. Uh, you have folks like Pete Smoroch, uh, who now works as a research scientist at LinkedIn. Uh, he has, uh, this, you can actually get all of this. He wrote a sort of a reference architecture for a data, a data mining system, where he took uh, data from uh, uh, Wikipedia combined it with Google News data, and used Hive to develop an application which, is, which he calls Trending Topics. And it looks at uh, topics at Wikipedia over a period of time. He released the data as an Amazon public data set. I'll talk about those in a bit as well. And uh, he's made the whole course available. This is a very quick idea of the architecture. It uses a Rails-based application. It uses MySQL. It uses Hive. It uses Hadoop. And it uses our Elastic Block Store system, which is where the data sets reside. But the part that I really like is the work, and this is, I would say, pioneering work that's been done by Mike Schatz uh, uh, at the University of Maryland. Uh, the life science community historically has, I can get the biggest box, I can get and use up all the memory attitude. Most of the programmers are folks like me who know how to write algorithms but don't know how to write good code. And uh, it can be a mess. And when things start scaling up, and as, these, as the nature of your sequence data started getting shorter, you started getting shorter reads, you had a problem. So what Mike decided to do a few years ago was try a simple problem. He figured that these scammers, these short read fragments, fit the MapReduce paradigm very well. And he decided to see if it worked. If it didn't work, it was not going to make any sense. So this is a simple application called Cloudburst that he developed a few years ago and open sourced. Uh, I think uh, that's where it's been published. Uh, 
uh, it essentially does a sim simple read alignment against a, a reference genome. You have the map phase, which is very catalog, and essentially emit the KMERS onto your reference. You collect all the seeds, because it uses a seed and extend paradigm at the shuffle phase, which is actually the magic part of Hadoop it's in the middle. Uh, map shuffle reduce is what it should be called. And at the end, in the reduction phase, it does the alignment. And it worked really well. I don't have numbers for his scale up, but he got on a 100 node, on a 96 node uh, EC2 cluster, he got a 100 node scale, 100 times scale up from the traditional uh, sort of sequential algo that was uh, that's sort of the gold standard in this community. And this was just the start. I think where things got really interested is where he collaborated with Ben Langmead. Uh, they're both in. Uh, they both were working with me, Hi Pop and Steve Salzberg at Maryland. Ben's a developer of a program called Bowtie, which is one of the better known aligners in the, uh, in the genomic space. What they did was they used a feature of Hadoop called Hadoop Streaming, where you actually don't need to write the functional programs. You actually can stream in existing code. They had to modify it a little bit. But what they did was for the map phase, they used Bowtie, which is doing very fast alignment. For the middle phase, the shuffle phase, they essentially binned and partitioned all, clustered all that middle intermediate data. And they took another open source uh, algorithm that detects mutation SNPs on those alignments. And they now have a pipeline as a map reduce function that anyone can get and run uh, called SOAP SNP. And this paper, I forget when they released it in genome biology, was for a while the most read paper uh, at genome biology for, for quite a bit of, bit of time. And actually, a lot of the interest in cloud computing has come from that because their paper was targeted cloud um, SNP discovery with cloud computing because all of this work was done on EC2. Uh, here are some numbers that they got. Now, the cost doesn't really mean anything because there's other costs associated with it. This is just a raw compute cost. But it was solving a real problem, especially because a lot of these aligners were very memory intensive. Um, the work that Mike's doing right now is actually probably even more interesting because assembly is a significantly tough and complex process. It takes big machines. To pick. There's even codes out there that uh, use close to a terabyte of memory. Uh, and he's trying to implement this as a, uh, in, a, in a Hadoop type environment, a MapReduce environment. It's a paper that they're working on called assembling large genomes in cloud computing. Bacterial genomes are easy. Human genomes are hard. Uh, this is still work ongoing. I won't show the data because of that. As I alluded to earlier, I'm mean, showing you all the stack that we have for AWS. Part of the problem is, A, Hadoop can be a little temperamental. Uh, as uh, Mihai has found out, their Hadoop cluster at Maryland keeps crashing. Uh, Mike actually lost a whole bunch of data because of that recently. And he's ready to, clo within two weeks of defending, so he's not a happy camper. Uh, so we, we decided to develop something called Amazon Elastic MapReduce. Elastic MapReduce is just not a wrapper on Hadoop. It's actually a, data f uh, a job flow engine where you essentially define a job or a series of jobs and then you pass over that definition to Elastic MapReduce and it takes over from you. It uses S3 as its source data store because hopefully you have your data in a nicely redundant environment. And then it does all the fun stuff in the middle. And it takes care of things like node failure, takes care of things like uh, uh, recently Hadoop didn't have a good debugger, so we actually created a debugger which is available uh, as part of, um, out of Elastic MapReduce. Uh, yesterday, we launched something called Bootstrap Actions, which allows you to put arbitrary applications and uh, things like that on your Hadoop clusters because, you want, uh, because we don't want people logging in necessarily and doing that because it's designed to be an abstraction. And one of the first things we did when we launched Elastic MapReduce was take this Cloudburst algorithm that Mike had developed and put it on there as an, a sample application. All a user does is, and literally this is how you use it from the UI, is you tell Elastic map reduce where your source data is in S3, you point it to the S3 bucket. You put in a jar file or a streaming script, and you tell it where the output's going to go and the size of the cluster you want, and you hit go, and that's it. So as an end user, if you have a series of applications available to you, you don't even really need to learn how to run, uh, you, you know, write, write uh, algorithms with Hadoop uh, jobs. So the reason I, I like Mike's work so much is it's actually inspired a lot of people to start thinking of algorithm development, rethinking how their code works, and then deploying it either as Amazon machine images, as virtual machines, or as part of Elastic MapReduce. And we continue to work very closely with Mike and Ben uh, uh, and have funded them through our education program. The other thing that makes the cloud very interesting, and this is where I talk to where you can't just FTP data from uh, or send it over to each other, is data storage and distribution, both public and private. Uh, on the public side, we have our Elastic, uh, sorry, our public uh, data sets project where you can get everything from Jay Flatley, who's the CEO of Illumina, his uh, genome, to actually the 
first uh, African genomes ever sequenced from a particular tribe in Nigeria, and to things like Ensemble, uh, where is it, over there, which, which is pretty cool. Data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, global weather measurements, um, mapping data, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, there's other people who are distributing data privately. So I'm a company, I have customers who are running EC2 job, who are running on EC2, I want to make my data available to them inside the same environment. So that's also happening today. I um, alluded to earlier, we have an import-export service. If you don't have a big bandwidth connection, you put, your disks on, you put your data onto a disk, you uh, sign, electronically sign a manifest, you submit a job, ship your disks, they come into us. You know, we, we're good at moving stuff around and dealing with UPS and FedEx. Uh, the data shows up in your S3 bucket and you get an email saying, uh, we're ready for you. That's really good for people moving data in. On the disaster recovery side, this is not a scientific problem necessarily, uh, people use the, uh, the export part of it, so they keep a lot of data inside AWS knowing that they can export it out if they have some kind of DR scenario. Uh, this also enables things like sharing and collaboration. Uh, I don't have any good pretty slides to show for it, but I've talked about, I mean, I think Ed also talked about it, is that the cloud makes a great, I think he quoted Bill, makes a great collaboration environment. In that project that I did when I was still at Rosetta, we wouldn't have had to ship the disks to 10 people. We'd have just shipped it into Amazon, and all of us would have access to the same common global names data space, and we could have all worked on that space. Uh, you don't have to have 20 copies. Uh, one of the reasons that we started the public data set project was we found that this, every different people were all getting the same data set, so essentially you have 20 copies of the same publicly available data set inside AWS, which, well, it earns its money, but it's, in, it's, it's inefficient. Um, it makes a great software distribution system. Uh, examples would be, this is another Large Hadron Collider project that comes from the Max Planck Institute. It's called the Atlas Project, where uh, Stefan Kluth has, has start, had started doing some prototyping work and has said people wanted to try it, could check it out. Uh, another very nice project uh, is, if you can see anything, is the Cloud Bio Linux project. This comes from the folks at the J. Craig Venter Institute. Uh, what they did was they looked at the Bio Linux distribution, which I think used to be, a, I don't know, I think Slackware or something like that, or maybe an Ubuntu distro, which is a bootable CD which will, with a stand, bunch of standard bioinformatics analysis tools on it. They've essentially created a cloud-based version of it, which runs, which you can get as an Amazon machine image uh, with all the tools that the average non-expert bioinformatician would need. Another really cool project, and I've been a long-term fan of Galaxy since way before I was at AWS. Um, the Galaxy project comes from Anton Nekrutenko at Penn State and James Taylor at Emory. Uh, it's been available for a long time. You could download it, run it. They now have a web-based application version of it. And last year, they applied for an AWS grant, and what they ended up developing, and uh, now it's publicly available, is Galaxy on the Cloud, where you can, anyone can instantiate their own Galaxy instance for, uh, Galaxy started for metagenomics, but now it's a, general sequence analysis uh, application with a standard bunch of tools, all the viewers you need. So it's, it's a one-stop pipeline for managing and looking at your genomic data. And uh, anyone can run it. All they need is an EC2 account and a credit card. The other thing that I think is, is a lot of fun and where some of the best innovation is going out is application platforms. Uh, these are nothing to do necessarily, not necessarily anything specifically to do with science. Heroku, for example, is one of my favorite uh, platforms. It's a Ruby on Rails uh, platform where all you have to do to push data to it, they take care of all the scaling, the management, is literally, if you're using Git, you do a Git push Heroku, and your application is running on Heroku after that, uh, pretty much. An uh, example of that is a Campedia, which comes from Rich Apodaca down in San Diego. It's sort of a social Wikipedia of chemical entities. Uh, it's running on Heroku. People can go in, edit stuff if there's mistakes, uh, add, add metadata to this. It's a fun project, which he did over a weekend. Uh, as a developer, all he has to worry about is his code, not about managing and deploying it. The other area, which is a lot of fun, actually, is in, ge is in the geospatial uh, space. And I'm actually really jealous of these guys. Because I think the ge uh, geo guys have de decided that APIs are great. And they create great APIs. So there's companies like Simple Geo, which work with folks like Skyhook Wireless to start mapping out where cell density is. And cell, you know, maybe at some kind of event where everybody's watching uh, the World Series or something like that or there'll be a whole big blob on top of wherever the finals are happening. So, not a baseball guy. Uh, but, oh, this is South by Southwest. So you can look at the density of probably iPhone usage uh, over there. And that's Manhattan, which is a little more diffuse. That's probably where the conference center was at South by Southwest. And Simple Geo, there's companies like Twilio, which does a telephony app. There's uh, Esri, which has uh, stuff going on in the geo space as well. These are platforms on which other people can build applications. With Simple Geo as a developer, I can take the core Simple Geo APIs, mash it up with other things, and do a lot of interesting stuff. 
And it's not started happening in the sciences. I wish it would, where people would take tools like Heroku, take uh, the APIs that AWS provides or some other, somebody else provides, and start building up these uh, application platforms that other people can build on top of. It's, hopefully, someday these uh, will start happening. Um, the other interesting area is business models, where you have a new way of getting new customers for more traditional companies like Wolfram Research and the MathWorks. So you can run MATLAB or Mathematica on AWS today, the grid backends. It's just another way. Their customers don't have to spend money on hardware. They just spend it on software and whatever it costs for them to run on AWS. Or companies like DNN Access, which are completely on the cloud. Uh, DNN Access actually came out of stealth at the meeting Roger and I were at last week, uh, where they essentially have a sequence data management and analysis system. They come out of Stanford, uh, another Stanford fund, VC funded companies. Uh, but it's a complete SaaS platform. Historically, you would have probably bought this as a shrink wrap package. And uh, uh, it's happening a lot more these days. And I'm probably still going to finish way ahead of time, so hopefully you'll get time for Q&A. So to conclude, what would I like to sort of say as a summary? Um, I sp spoke to you a little bit about AWS and what AWS does and how it's used. For the scientific folks in this audience, you know, infrastructure clouds are designed for scale. That's what they were built for. That's where the origins is. They're also built for availability, so you can always get to them anytime you want to. You don't have to wait for in a queue to get to a, a supercomputing system. You don't have to wait for your servers to arrive just because you got more data than you were used to or ran out of disk. You have the ability to have shared data spaces and global namespaces. As an example, in S3, if you create a bucket, it's a global namespace. If you make it public, anyone in the world can have access to that one global namespace. It's kind of cool. You can say, my data, and throw whatever else you want it, and everybody can. My data is probably taken, but still. Uh, the other part that's interesting, and I didn't talk about this too much, is task-based resources. Typically, in a shared system, what you have is a shared file system and a cluster that you share with about 20 other people, or you're running 20 different tasks on it. So it's still a shared system. With, e with AWS, what happens is every EC2 cluster is a discrete entity. You're not sharing resources with anybody else. You're not com competing with resources with a second cluster. You have your own cluster. Uh, one of the reasons EC2 is very popular for educational courses is, for example, at MIT, their IT won't let students get root access uh, on, on their clusters. But with EC2, they can. So their entire CS50 course is now taught on EC2 because students blow something up. It doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, so you can create resources that are for a dedicated task, especially if you have this shared common data space that you can access. You can have people trying out new software architectures. Uh, Mike's a great example of that. There are other examples of people doing some very innovative stuff where they're taking advantage of loose, loosely coupled systems and systems that are massively distributed. Uh, you can try out new computing platforms. You can deploy SunGrid Engine. You can deploy, and I suspect you can deploy things like LSF on AWS as well, which is well and good. But you can try these very dynamic systems like uh, document, uh, like Cloud Crowd or uh, uh, the Star system from MIT or the Right Grid system from Right Scale, uh, or just build your own. It's not that difficult. And the best part is you can do it right now. Uh, and you don't have to wait around. Just start running, just start hammering at it. You've seen enough, enough heard of enough examples today. Uh, and one last plug, uh, we have an education program. Uh, it's basically what we do is we provide I think we have three submission or four submission deadlines every year. You submit a little abstract of what you want to do, uh, and you get credits, uh, compute and storage credits to use. Uh, examples, here are some examples of the kinds of stuff that we funded uh, using that. Uh, and uh, at the end of that, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to definitely thank James, who I've le I always learned a lot from, Matt Wood, uh, who used to be at the Sanger, now works for a company called Macintosh, which makes a program called Papers. If you're a Mac user and you like managing data, uh, managing your uh, PDF library or your papers. It's really, really good. And uh, uh, I love Larry Lessig's presentation style. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Deepak. Um, we have ample time for questions. You just raise your hand. I'll bring a microphone to you so you can ask our speaker. Hello, thanks for your talk. Uh, Gerth van Mechelen from the University of Antwerp. Um, I have a question on the, the new, well, new, the spot market that you introduced. Um, currently, it's fairly, let's say, not really transparent how this market operates. Is this company classified, or could you hint at how this 
market forms its prices, how it works. Yeah, so it's, a, it's our own algorithm right now. What, what we do provide is a history of pricing. So with the API, you can, you can get the latest price or you can get historical prices. Uh, in fact, there's a website called cloudexchange.com, which tracks all our pricing history. Uh, most of the time, the prices stay roughly about a third of the actual price. And every now and then, it once in a while, it go poof, because we don't have a ceiling to how high you can submit your bids. It's based on supply and demand. Uh, it's still early days. We, it's a simple, you know, we decided to keep things simple because we want to see how people use it, what kind of, you know, what kind of usage patterns there are, and it'll evolve. So at some point in time, we might talk about, you know, how exactly it works, but I think how it works is going to evolve over time also as people use it in different ways. But right now what we expose is your pricing history. And are you experimenting internally with that? I mean, looking at new mechanism designs to, to we, are, design? we, are, we continue to look at what, other, what, what else makes sense. So if you have any ideas on what you would like to see uh, as in that kind of dynamic uh, capacity system, yeah, um, we are open to ideas. Uh, you know, as I said, one of the things we like doing is start simple, see what people do, and then try and adjust to that. I guess that's yeah. a good approach. Thanks. Yeah. Ricardo Jimenez from the Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. Uh, so for using EC2 for experimenting, computer science experimenting, not uh, science, we, uh, we need, for instance, like uh, 600, 800, 1,000 instances simultaneously mm -hmm. because we are going to run a cloud uh, computing yeah. platform on top of EC2. Is this feasible or...? Yeah. It's definitely feasible. Now, if you're getting that many resources, uh, obviously, if you suddenly say, I want a thousand, you'll probably get a call from me or somebody else to try and figure out what you're, who you are, whether you're legitimate, whether you're trying to be, you know, just trying to understand what you're doing. We have single individual customers who are using much more than that every day. Uh, so it, it's definitely feasible. Uh, we just have to figure out, we just have to make sure that, uh, you know, it, 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 what we try and do is make sure that it's a legitimate use, which in your case would be and try and figure out what's the best way to make that available to you. But in our case, uh, what we do is, of course, uh, there are experiments, sustainability mm -hmm. experiments yeah. and so on, so the use is not for long term as uh, an industrial customer. So, uh, That's fine. A lot of our usage, uh, you know, you have, I won't mention names, we have big companies with their big infrastructures, but they do a lot of uh, development work on AWS, right, where they're testing out new algorithms, and always at scale. Uh, so that's a very common use case for us, load testing. I think one of the classic use cases we've seen is there's a company called Soasta that does load test. They did a million user load test for MySpace where they spun up 800 nodes for three hours or four hours. And they do it once a month with, for different, uh, 800 is rare. Uh, normally they do three, 400. Uh, so 800 nodes is what, 1600 cores. Uh, so it's definitely doable. Uh, your default limit with EC2 is 20 instances. That's when you start. So you have to submit a request for more. And at that point of time, you'll probably get a call from wherever who your appropriate contact in your location is, try and figure out, yes, is this, you know, what's your usage pattern going to be? Because that also helps us manage capacity. If we know you're going to stay all the time every day, we can adjust to that. If we know you're going to come in and out, we, we can adjust accordingly. Yeah. Hi, uh, Chris Menzel, Moore Foundation. I, I'm just wondering what, if you could talk a little bit about the criteria you use for deciding what public data sets you, uh, you provide. Uh, no, uh, I think the core criteria is because we are storing them as snapshots, EBS snapshots today, is it should be something that's useful to a community. If it's, you, you know, all the pictures you've taken in your life and you're the only person who'd ever be interested in it, not so much interest to us. But if it's a data set that's a reasonable size where, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, we'll kind of do it on a case-by-case -case basis and see what we ask the person submitting the data set is who would use this. And especially if it's something we've not heard of. Or in some cases, they go to the data producer like Ensemble and say, hey, people are asking for it. Can you, can you start moving, moving Ensemble to us? Our approach has been we'll see how the, what the usage patterns are. And we might go back to somebody and say, nobody's using it. Hasn't happened yet. Uh, but so right, it, it, again, it's, it's still early days. It'll, that'll also definitely evolve over time. Uh, right now, it's kind of a, as long as we are sure that you have the rights to put the data up there and that you can convince us that there's, you, people actually use it, we are, we are fine with it. <clears throat> yeah. So Alex Yasup, TU Delft, the Netherlands. Um, we've been doing over the past two years experiments with various clouds, um, infrastructure as a service clouds, uh, trying in particular to run scientific applications. And we've been surprised by the very poor performance that, that we've seen there. Yeah. Um, I have a question that is a bit longer. 
Um, first, do you really plan to support scientific applications, such as my colleague has suggested before, those 600 or 200 yeah. or whatever parallel applications in particular? Um, and do you really, as you mentioned about the slide uh, in your presentation, do you really don't do any kind of resource sharing, any particular network? So let, when I was talking about resource sharing, so the two things that you get, just sort of a going back to how EC2 works, the two things on EC2 that are hard scheduled are compute, CPU, and memory. That's hard scheduled. That's the performance you're going to get. I.O. as a whole is a resource. Uh, when I said you're not sharing your resources, you don't have one cluster and everybody's hitting on. If you create a cluster, you're the only person using the, you know, if you're using the right instance type, you'll pretty much be the only person on those nodes. Now, what you don't have control of is node placement. Right? And that's the reason why a lot of traditional, uh, I'll use the word traditional scientific codes run into trouble. Because they expect certain rack locality. They make assumptions. If you're using MPI code, they assume they're talking to the same switch. Uh, that's not our kind of environment today. And that's why you'll see poor performance. We can give you guidance on it. For example, if you're lucky, you might just, uh, if you use the largest instance types that we get, you're essentially getting the full network right, for that, in, for that box. But you don't know where the other instance that it's talking to is. If you're lucky, it could be close by. But the more nodes you provision, the more further away they are, you know, spread out they're likely to be. Uh, so these nodes are really yeah, and, and because our goal is to try and make sure that you're not, uh, it's almost, uh, the availability becomes the first priority, first thing you uh, design for, so we try and make sure that everybody's not, on, you know, if a rack goes away, everything that you have doesn't go away. So we actually spread you out, uh, which works very well for embarrassingly parallel stuff because you don't care. Uh, but for tightly coupled jobs, yes. And so anybody who comes to me and says, my thing doesn't scale beyond four nodes and I'm running uh, mpitch2 and doing molecular dynamics, I'm like, yes, not surprising at all. Uh, we're still f trying to figure out what we would do in that use case. We haven't, don't have a good answer. I was talking to uh, you earlier. Uh, it's, you know, it, we want to try and do it in a way that makes sense, or if, we, if it makes sense at all, we don't even know that yet. Uh, but if you're doing sort of distributed computing, embarrassingly parallel simulations, or simulation, or any cal com computation where I.O. is not your, going to be most of your stuff, you'll be in good shape. The moment I.O. becomes your dominant things, if you can't put it into a MapReduce -like type environment, then you are going to run into these kinds of performance issues. Yeah. So a related question. On your private clouds, though, aren't you actually pushing the workloads into a very isolated piece of hardware, network, everything? It's virtually isolated. For, okay. Uh, yeah. Very good. Yeah. It's, it's, you're, not, you're not giving you a Basically. dedicated set of boxes. So if you shut it down, you come back again, you're not going to get the same machine. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Yeah. Very good. Other questions, please? Hi, I'm uh, Lucas Kenzel from uh, Czech Technical University in Prague. Um, you mentioned that there is uh, interaction now with um, suits like MATLAB. Um, can you say a few more words how that how that works and you know yeah. wh who's actually doing the parallelization? Is it uh, you or MathWorks? Or? MathWorks. Right. So the philosophy we take is MathWorks knows how their software is built. So uh, their grid, so if you go to MATLAB and you, you know, they have this grid product, you can choose EC2 as a deployment endpoint and it basically launch their grid backend and a bunch of workers on EC2. Uh, the MPI part I think doesn't works, but it's not that going to be that performant. It's the more of the grid backend that they really encourage people to use and what people are using. Same with, uh, same with uh, Mathematica. Essentially, you can start from your, from your notebook and just launch a grid back end, and they built it. We, uh, we, we, and we didn't even do anything at all. We just know that they're doing it. So, so what's our, do you know what sort of a license do you need from so, them to do yeah. uh, that? Uh, I think Mathematica, I think, have a per use. So different companies do it different ways. I think Mathematica, uh, Wolfram went with a per use kind of licensing. I don't know, ex uh, I'm not that familiar with people using uh, Mathematica. On the MATLAB side, they still use good old FlexLM. You need to have a license manager running somewhere else. Uh, you check out your licenses. Uh, they do license borrowing, so it's floating licenses or whatever the standard uh, FlexLM policies they have. That's not uncommon, actually. Uh, Any additional questions? Okay, great. Sharunas Girdziauskas, Swedish Institute of Computer Science. I would like to ask you, with the current, current trends of uh, incoming users and all the data, do you expect in three to five years to be still scalable and uh, be able to provide uh, the same sort of uh, quality? Yeah, I mean, that's what we do, right? I mean, today, I mean, we have 
a whole group that's all they're doing is building our infrastructure, trying to, trying to make sure that it keeps scaling. Uh, proof lies in the pudding. So far, we've been around, what, three years. We've done pretty fine, and we keep growing. And the kind of users and the kind of load on the systems keeps growing. Uh, obviously, you learn along the way on what, you know, as different kinds of workloads come on, you have to make changes or adjust your systems to that. Uh, the good news is that that's a, that's a core competency. That's what you're thinking about all the time. That's why we have folks like, you know, James Hamilton, I'll pick a name, who that's kind of what he thinks and dream, thinks and breeds all the time. Uh, so, absolutely. Uh, this is so. This is a separate business unit core, you know, business unit for Amazon. So it's as serious as retail. We spend as much as we would on that. Uh, Stephen Wong, uh, Rice University. Uh, have you thought about uh, problems where you have um, highly interactive? In, um, applications such as like uh, um, online games and other th those sort of inter things where you've got lots of things going on, but in scalability requirements, but yeah. highly interactive with it with the speed, the network speed. Is so I think eight of the top ten Facebook games run on Amazon. So that's happening today. Uh, Farmville runs on Amazon. Everything that Playfish does runs on Amazon. There's games from big gaming companies I can't mention which names they are that are console games that are running on Amazon today. So that's already happening. Uh, people build their applications to adjust to sort of our sort of distributed infrastructure. They might build peering arrangements with us. You know, there's ways to make sure that performance is good. Uh, there might be companies that spend their money on network, make sure they're ne good networking to us and not on servers. Uh, what won't work is ultra low latency systems where you have, uh, and I go off gaming to uh, high frequency trading, right? Uh, where you have to do very, very sub millisecond trades. There are a bunch of HFT companies running on AWS today. What they do is they build their models on AWS. They deploy them to the exchanges where they have cabinets. They do the high frequency stuff there every half, two hours, and the markets change because they've traded so often. They come back, rebuild their models, and then deploy the new ones. Uh, so you have to decide. If, the, if you're very sensitive to jitter, for example, where even a little bit of jitter in the system is a problem. In a shared I.O. resource, we talked about that. That's going to be a problem. If you sort of understand that, adjust for that, you can build pretty performant interactive systems as well. Uh, people are doing that right now. A lot of those games are just sort of single user going in and doing something, but they're not necessarily where you've got these um, like the multi-user. No, so there are some. I can't mention them by name, uh, which ones. There, there, are the, there are those running today by big MM, whatever they call them, uh, console games. I'm not much of a gamer. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? All right, let's thank Deepak one last time for a great talk.